everybody, and welcome uh, back to another uh, episode of Air Raid Radio. Um, today, our guest is Lieutenant Colonel Olga E. Custodio, uh, retired U.S. Air Force. Welcome, Olga. Thank you for having me. Welcome, and nice <laughs> meeting you both. Yeah, nice, nice to meet you. And Kara's got a little uh, bio that she's going to read really quick before we get started. Yeah, uh, we're very excited to have you on the show. Um, so for our viewers, um, Olga is the first female Hispanic U.S. Air Force military pilot. She graduated in the top 5% of her class. And upon retiring from the U.S. Air Force, she became one of the first female Hispanic commercial airline captains for American Airlines. And she was one of the first female pilot instructors for the supersonic T-38, um, which is one of the world's most difficult jets to fly. Um, she's also been recognized twice for her achievements by the Senate of Puerto Rico and was inducted into the San Antonio Aviation and Aerospace Hall of Fame. She is a charter member of the Women Military Aviators Association and is the vice president of the Hispanic Association of Aviation and Aerospace Professionals, in which she encourages the next generation of ladies to never shy away from their dreams. Holy cats, you're, you seem like you've got a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just the tip of the iceberg, so. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, well, thank you for joining us on our show. We're, like I said, we are very excited to um, have the chance to um, talk with you about all of your achievements. Um, so um, I guess one of our first questions that we always ask our guests is, how did you get started in aviation? It's the, the, the important question, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. How, how did I meet my first airplane? So um, I have to say that having grown up as an army brat, I lived around the world. So I was in airplanes a lot, you know, flying from one country to the other where we uh, moved to, lived in. And so I was used to being up in the air, but I never dreamed that I would have ever piloted an aircraft. Mm -hmm. So my goal was to join the military like my father, but I selected the Air Force instead of the Army. Mm -hmm. And that took about 10 years in the making because uh, when I graduated high school at 16, I went to college and the ROTC unit didn't accept me because I guess women weren't um, allowed in ROTC at the time. Yeah. So I changed my major from math to business. I still got a minor in math, which is my thing. But um, it took me 10 years after that to finally get the opportunity to join the Air Force. And at the time, they were looking for female uh, pilot candidates. So I guess the timing was perfect where I had the opportunity to serve my country in the military as a commission officer and fly an airplane for the uh, Air Force. So I think that was uh, a, a weight worth, you know, the, the experiences I had. I was already a wife. I was already a mother. So when I started, you know, I mean, I had all those things that I brought with me into pilot training and uh, I guess it grounded me it helped me it helped me get through the program not having to worry about other things well you know being a mother and a wife there's a lot of stuff going on there <laughs> too but you know my husband was very supportive so that's kind of how I I started in in aviation you know when you when you're growing up you think oh i could be a flight attendant or i can you know have, right. fly for an airline like that but never dreaming that women could be pilots yeah what what year were you um when our uh, in school when our, it was 1969 okay you know? yeah and i think women were first accepted maybe a year or so later, but okay. having given that up, I, I never pursued it afterwards, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and what, um, sorry. <laughs> like, some notes. Just, I have <laughs> notes and they of course are buried. Um, no problem. So I guess, um, what was it about aviation that, or what was it about flying that attracted you to wanting to do that? Well, I think the fact that I could go to pilot training and fly a T-38 because 
back in the day, I don't know if you've seen the high flight where they use the T38 when they used to sign off TV, you know, it wasn't a 24 seven thing. Right, right, and, yeah. And so they'd sign off the air with high flight, mm -hmm. you know, just before they mm -hmm. shut down the signal. Yeah. And so I always saw that. And the fact that um, I was going to be able to fly that aircraft was just incredible to me. And I think in T-37s, which was, you know, the um, basic under pilot uh, graduation, I mean, under pilot training, you know, it was a jet, it was a side-by-side -side seater, and it was, it was good. It wasn't, um, it wasn't anything spectacular. It wasn't supersonic. It wasn't fast. <laughs> it wasn't a hot rod, you know. Yeah. So when I got to the T-38. Just an airplane. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was an airplane. But when I, when I got to the T-38, that, that was really incredible. The, the speed, just the sleekness of the airplane, the aerodynamics yeah. and, and the, all the acrobatics we could do with it was just incredible and i think that's when i really fell in love with with flying like two thousand percent you know i mean to to have that opportunity to fly that airplane was yeah was incredible oh, so yeah. it, it i'm sorry it, it's to me it was like you know i i get to wear a uniform and fly this awesome plane and have the best job in the air force so <laughs> Yeah. What's, you, oh, what's the most challenging part about flying the um, T-38? I think keeping up with the speed. Mm -hmm. A lot of people could not keep up with the speed because mm -hmm. in flying, you, you have to be way ahead of the airplane. Mm -hmm. So you're not only present in the moment, you're, you know, 10, 20, depending how many miles out, you already have to think about what you are going to need to do to get from where you are to where you're going. And if you can't keep up with that speed, um, you know, the thought process to fly that is, is very fast. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. probably a little overwhelming too. <laughs> At least initially. <laughs> right. My eyeball right. was like, what? <laughs> I know, I know. We had a student actually who came in, he was a commuter pilot and he came into the training and in T-37s, he just aced, you know, the, that aircraft. When he got to T-38s, he washed out because he could not keep up with the airplane. Wow. Even with, with his 3,000 hours of, of uh, yeah. flying. So, wow. Yeah, that does sound like a challenging plane to fly. How fast does it go? Well, um, we just went uh, past... Uh, you know, 1.1 Mach, but mm -hmm. just past uh, the speed of sound. And the, the way we could get it into <laughs> supersonic is we'd have to zoom up and then start this dive down. So it wasn't a straight supersonic flight. We'd have to dive down to, to pick up the speed, you know. Wow. And we'd always tell our students, well, when we hit supersonic, you won't be able to hear me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know that, that they got over that pretty fast so oh my gosh wow i am um, i'm learning how to fly in a satabria and a cessna yeah. so like supersonic is like just kind of blows my mind <laughs> yeah oh yeah. my goodness but it's just a it's it's just something you really don't feel the speed unless yeah. you are in let's say you know these newer aircraft f-16 f-15 f-35 and you're like really low on the deck and then you feel the speed but up high you, you really can't yeah. can't tell you know? oh yeah i'm sure at a certain point like even when you're i think about this in the car when you're driving and like right. like when you're like i was like i'm going 70 and i feel like i'm not moving at all right yeah yeah, exactly. uh, I'm sure exactly. it's a lot, a lot more like that up there. <laughs> like, I don't right, know. It's it's that. very similar, very similar. <laughs> yeah, a good, good analogy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like that. So you, you, you know, you're going that fast, but you don't, you don't feel it. You know? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Did you get a chance to train a lot of other female uh, pilots during during your time in the military? Um, I had a, a couple of students. What eventually happened is um, in in my flight, you know, I had my my regular students, and I I became my my technique of teaching was different than the males, my counterparts, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I eventually became an 88 pilot, which is where I worked with the weaker students. So I was able to, to offer them more techniques, you know, for the same maneuver, I had like two or three techniques of how to fly the maneuver. Yeah. And so if one didn't work, we try something else and something else. So I would try to get them up to speed if they failed a ride. So the next ride that they'd be able to pass that phase of, of training. And um, unfortunately, I did have one of the students, a uh, female that came to me, she was a, a weaker student. And we didn't have that many females. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, she was one of two, I say, in, that came through our flight. Um, and she came from the Air Force Academy. But she, she wasn't able to, to make it through. The other student I had who also didn't make it through, unfortunately, she, her family was from the Taylor craft aircraft family. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. You yeah. know, and I figured, Oh, she's, she's going to yeah. do great. And again, yeah. it has to do with the speed, you know, that your, yeah. your, your thought process and I'm flying that airplane. So that was the challenging part. It's not that, the pilot skills weren't there. It's just keeping up with the airplane. Sure. So, yeah. yeah it's not an airplane to keep up with. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mm -hmm. almost feel like your brain is either wired to be able to ha handle that or it's not. Cause that's, yeah. Um, again, like just equating just the, the speed going, doing anything when you go right. faster. Um, right. Absolutely. Like well, like race car drivers, if you yeah. will, you know, yeah on the track and you know they're they're yeah. managing their every second or millisecond of move or yeah. how much power they put in you know what turns they're going to make and, and, and anticipation just, right. yeah right. Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. yeah i don't think i i don't think i have the brain power to do that <laughs> <laughs> i like the low and slow i'm I you know, just cut along and like if I'm 22, like let's yeah. just go for a ride. <laughs> it's like you're sightseeing, which I I enjoy that too. You know, being able to do that. So yeah, someday I would like to do the really fast jet, but just once. <laughs> so I could, could no, no, absolutely. We we would give like during Christmas, um, we would give incentive rides to the the ground crew, you know, the crew chiefs, the maintenance oh, guys, thing, because yeah. they work on these airplanes yeah. and some of them have never ridden in one. Yeah. So they'd be selected by their commander and, and get an incentive ride. And I remember taking up one kid. Um, I think he was a crew chief or maintenance. I'm not sure, but we went up and he didn't want to do anything. He didn't even want to do an aileron roll. Oh. And I said, to be in this airplane and just fly straight and level, just droning yeah. around is not an experience. Yes, you're in the aircraft. So I said, you have to fly upside down at least once to <laughs> see yeah. that you did it. Yeah. He, and he, he was fighting me the whole way. And before he even knew it, I just put it in there. We did a quick <laughs> aileron roll. He goes, I want to go back. I want to go back. I'm like, okay, <laughs> but you went upside down. So I, I brought him back. And yeah. I said, now you can tell everybody that you, you were upside down in a yeah. thing. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Always, always fun to go upside down. Oh, yes. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, Olga, um, a lot, we, Amy and I have been doing a lot of research um, on you for our interview and um, came across a lot of <laughs> interviews um, where you discuss um, a lot of the challenges you have faced throughout your career. Um, and we kind of went over the ROTC one where they wouldn't let you do it because you're, you're a woman. But um, do you have other experiences where you kind of had to like headbutt against the system a little bit? Um, yes, there were, there were challenges, but I think, you know, having grown up in different countries, different cultures, 
um, knowing that, that people are different, their mindset is different, but you, you kind of learn how to respect other people and any challenge in, or barrier that I was put up against, I think I, I was able to deal with that and work around it because of that, because knowing that, that people have their bias, people, you know, think very differently. Yeah. And, and I was very fortunate to seek out my mentors mm -hmm. and, and they were able to help me. In fact, uh, my flight commander at, um, what, when I was an instructor at Laughlin undergraduate pilot training, um, he's the one that recommended me to go to Randolph and Randolph Air Force Base. They train pilots to become instructors. So here I was, the first female instructor, T-38 instructor at Laughlin, and now I'm going to the 560th, which is uh, training pilots to become instructors. And, and he, he recommended me to go, and I, and I was the first female instructor there. So I think it's how you present yourself sure. that I was able to overcome that. Now, I did try to join the Air Force uh, a second time before I got in that last time and I went to a, a recruiter and my husband and I wanted to join together we are married already married and we took the test got the high AFOQT scores and I already had my degree and I knew I could become a commissioned officer but he didn't want to offer it to me you know really? he wanted he wanted me to go enlisted and then try and I said, no, because I know I'm qualified. Yeah. So I just stepped back, you know, because I knew I was qualified for something more. Yeah. And, and to accept something less wasn't something I was willing to do at the time. Yeah. So, but, you know, right place, the right time, waited a few more years and, and, and I got what I got, which was amazing. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, Chris, Chris Henry, who hooked us up with this interview, um, told us the story about um can you tell us the story about when you applied to the air force um and they asked what um you wanted to do in the air force um you mean with the army recruiter yeah yeah and you were yeah. Yeah. So, so i was in the, i was in the canal zone i was in the canal zone and um in panama and at the time they when I, when I found out that they were recruiting uh, female candidates uh, for the Air Force, for pilot candidates, I looked for a recruiting office. And in the Canal Zone, there, was, there weren't any recruiting offices. The only recruiting office was the Army. And I knew I didn't want to join the Army. But I went there anyway just to see if the Army had some aviation opportunities. And so I sat down with the recruiter and asked him about the aviation opportunities in the army but when he found out that i was married and i had a child he kicked me out of the recruiting office he said thank you but there's the door and my response was well thank you but i didn't want to join the army anyway <laughs> yeah so i just walked out i go okay but yeah i i found a um a staff sergeant at the um uh military and civilian personnel center, mm -hmm. which he would go down to the high schools to recruit high school graduates mm -hmm. into the Air Force, but he had never recruited an officer, mm -hmm. uh, a candidate before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having been working at the Department of Defense, I had access to the regulations and and so I, I told him not to worry because, you know, I was gonna help him help me get this yeah. done. I like it. <laughs> I'll, I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> no, he, was, he was great. He was great. Yeah. He goes, sure, you know, anything you need. So, yeah. you know, I, I, this time I, I, I went in informed. I did my research. I did my, you know, and, and it's something I learned through the years that, that you have to have a plan. You have to find out exactly what you need and, and, yeah. As young as I was when I started, you know, at 16, you're naive. So if somebody says, oh, I'm sorry, you know, this is not going to work or we can't do, you're like, oh, thank you, you know, and, and walk away. Yeah. 
Um, and so there's nothing you can do. But this time around, I said, no, this is my last chance. And the, the reason also was because they had a cutoff. I was uh, 26 and a half was the cutoff for pilot training. Oh. And, yeah. And I was already 25 and a half. So <laughs> you had to do it. Yeah. I, right. this, yeah. this was it. This was it. Right. <laughs> so I think I started pilot training just a few weeks shy of my 26 and a half birthday. Oh my gosh. So wow. I just slid right in there. Yeah. That's very specific. Why there and it's not like 26. <laughs> but yeah, like 26 I don't know. Now it's up to 30 something, you know. Oh, yeah, that sounds right. Uh, yeah. Um, incredible. What was it like um, having a family while going through all of the, the training? Right. Well, training was, was very intense. There were 12 hour days. Yeah. I would take Saturday off. And on Sundays, I'd be washing a load of clothes with my books, you know, sitting by the, the washer and just, you know, because we lived off base in an apartment complex. So I had to go to the, the laundry room and it kind of got me away. And my husband would take care of our daughter. Um, she was four. And so I would, I would have time to do that. Or while I was cooking, I'd have my emergency procedures, you know, popped up and I'm learning my, my red box items and just, you know, okay. cooking and, and studying at the same time. So it was, it was something that we worked on. I mean, the work-life balance is really important. Yeah. You know, jump right into that. Mm -hmm. And the other important thing is having a spouse who's very supportive because That's without true. that, you know, it, it, they would just add one more thing to the challenges to, to have to work on that. But um, we worked on it and he was enlisted. I was an officer. So, I mean, we, we were way out of the box, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. for that. But uh, yeah, it worked great. Now, when I went to the American Airlines, um, I had to go away for training so i was i was gone for training we live in san antonio training was up in in dallas fort worth so i was gone you know the whole three months that it took okay. to do the initial training with american airlines mm -hmm. but uh and every time i went back to recurrent or whatever and and then the first year was challenging at american because um you don't you didn't get your flight benefits to come back and forth and i was stationed oh, up in chicago um so luckily i stayed in the reserves so because i had reserve duty i would get a pass to come back to san antonio to do my reserve duty and offer the opportunity to to see my family you know and then after i think it was six seven months then i got the flight benefits so but our first christmas I bid to go to Houston because that's close to San Antonio. Right. And I had back to back layovers mm -hmm. um, at, at the same uh, hotel. So I talked to the manager when I checked in. I said, Look, my family's coming. Do you mind if they just stay in the room? Because I'm coming back tonight and yeah. you can keep the same room. And sure enough, so my husband drove the, with the kids. By that time, uh, we had two kids. My kids are nine years apart. Okay. I have a girl and then my son. Um, and so he drove the kids to Houston, met up with me, and I had early morning goes. Our takeoff was at 5 o'clock oh in the morning. <laughs> and then I was done by noon. So I had the rest of the day to, to be with them. So we went out. We, you know, we kind of drove around and spent time together. Um, while I was flying, my husband would take the kids to the airport. That's before uh, you had to go through. Uh, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so yeah. They, when you get right, so so you, They yeah. could go right to the gate and everything. And in Houston, they had this little tram that went around to all the terminals. So he would entertain them, put them <laughs> in the tram. <laughs> And take them around, and so it, it was our it was our first Christmas that we spent together. You know, once when I started with American, so that was that was challenging. Yeah. The other challenging thing I want to talk about is the 
the captains at American Airlines, mm. um, when I was coming in, the older generation of captains were just starting to retire. And, and I called them crusty captains with a different mindset. They couldn't understand what we as females, and I say we, there was maybe five, 6,000 pilots and they were 25 to 28 of us, female pilots at American. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. So to see us come to the flight deck and they just couldn't understand that, you know, mm -hmm. but I just let them know that, you know, I'm here because I earned to be here. It's not that somebody gave this it, to me. Yeah, right. yeah. So, you earned your wings. Yeah. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. So, I mean, but, you know, it, it, it's just how you present yourself to, I think. Yeah. It's, makes it difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What year was that? I went to American Airlines in, in 88. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And they had, they had just started the no smoking policy, which uh -huh. was another reason that they were very irritated <laughs> because they couldn't <laughs> smoke in the flight deck. And so they were just. Just awful. <laughs> they were yeah, just crabby they, the whole they, way around. <laughs> right. Right. Thank goodness. So I started there on a 727 sitting sideways as a flight engineer. Oh, so okay. I, uh, I had to get my flight engineer uh, certificate uh, okay. license. And so when I got out of the Air Force, I got that. But while I was in the Air Force, right after pilot training, um, I went and took the exam and got my, my commercial pilot's license. Okay. And uh, I just put that in the my back pocket and I said I don't know if I'm ever going to use this and, and sure enough I did <laughs> I'm being overrun I'm so sorry <laughs> oh, oh. it's not a show of ours if there's not a cat on Amy's lap you know, like they're both here none of them are both here. I'm so sorry Olga <laughs> that's okay I I my kitty was 17 years old and just last week he he just walked away. He just left. Aww. And so I, Sorry. you know, I know. Aww. But anyway. 17's a, an old cat. He yeah. is. He, he had a good life and he was fine, you know, but I know sometimes kitties just like to yeah. die by themselves or maybe somebody found him and he's living out his, his last days with somebody loving and caring so yeah i'm hopeful for that, that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, i'm going with that i'm going yeah. with that so. do uh do your kids fly at all uh no they don't and i and i tried to take them up but for me to let my kids choose their own yeah profession yeah. is important you know i know a lot of families you know if they're lawyers well the kids become lawyers or if they're right. doctors and the kids and you know so on and so on they they go into the family business um being the only pilot in my whole family um i i didn't want to impose that this is what you need to do but i did expose them to it you know my husband is an airplane geek he, he loves airplanes i mean he he we'd go to air shows because he wanted to go to air shows not because i was out there like <laughs> oh funny <laughs> no i know i know but um he he always wanted to to be around airplanes in fact we met we both worked for a commuter airline so we met in the airline industry and um and so in the air force he worked at uh, base operations Okay. So he was on the flight line too. So I guess, you know, the both of us have, have been in, in aviation our whole yeah. career yeah. for the most part, because then he got out and he became a, a procurement officer, contractor, and his first position, he'd buy airplane parts, you know, for, for different uh, detachments and units and and for foreign uh, governments and stuff like okay. that. So oh, cool. aviation's there, but the kids didn't, yeah. didn't follow in aviation. You know, my daughter's in IT. Okay. And my son's in oil and gas. He's a, a data analyst 
for <laughs> oil and gas and, and so you know yeah there's a little bit Let's of a see. connection airplanes need oil and gas <laughs> exactly yeah so, you know and now they're all computers so yeah that's true that's true <laughs> see yeah. it's sort of the same <laughs> kind of related well that's the good thing about aviation that it doesn't matter what your specialty is mm -hmm. it's connected to aviation somehow or aerospace you know you're a structural engineer or you're into avionics or you're a flight nurse you know or you're air traffic controller or firefighter so there, there's so many ways that you could still be connected to aviation and not be a pilot or not be in the flight deck mm -hmm. or in the airplane. So, yeah. which I think is important. And that's why I, tr what I try to bring to a lot of uh, young student conferences that, that I go to, that we put on here locally and, and talk to them, you know, yes, I'm a pilot, but doesn't mean you have to be one too. If that's what you want, then great. You know, I, I can help you with that. But if not, Think about other ways, if you want to be in aviation, how you can be connected. Because like you said, not everybody can have that mindset to yeah. fly an airplane. Yeah. So, um, but aviation and aerospace, you know, the professions are just so Huge. wide. Mm -hmm. to, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think that become exactly everybody's thought is that the first question out of everyone's mouth when they find out I'm into aviation, they're like, oh, are you? do you fly? And I was, I think that's just, everybody just automatically assumes that you have to be a pilot, which um, can be a challenge for some people. And um, Adam and my husband and I have made a documentary about um, the first women, um, the first women's air race in 1929 from cr for cross country. And one of the things I was trying to do for research for that was um, to see why our percentage of women pilots are still so low because it's still the same as it was in 1929. And I'm like, well, well, well why? And I think <laughs> a lot of that is just that, um, it, at least what I could kind uh -huh. of half figure out was that uh, women tend are, are more family oriented and they just don't have the time or, um, they just don't have time to do it. So I feel like that was a lot of the times too when I would ask people about it, they're like, oh yeah, I used to fly, but you know, like kids got in the way. So, um, and then they come back at it after the kids have graduated. So, yeah. um, but I always feel like, um, I love the women in aviation that they're, um, it's more encompassing where it's everything about aviation um, to the point of just even if you just like airplanes. <laughs> right, right. So, you can be an enthusiast, you yeah. know, so that, that's, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But to your point of why there aren't more women, mm -hmm. uh, especially as, as pilots, yeah. I think that as women, as CEOs of a corporation, mm -hmm. why aren't there more women mm -hmm. or, it's slowly rising women in politics with women yeah. in government you know you think about that yeah. and the thing is that for the most part women are the caretakers of the family yeah so they not only have a profession mm -hmm. but then they have to take care of their families yeah. and and most women want families others don't make yeah. that choice yeah. and yeah. and so that's a hard thing you know yeah. And the, the thing that needs to change is have women uh, get better, how would I say, flexibility in the workplace yeah. to be able to manage all of that. And yeah. it's not there. You know, you have the, the maternity leave. You yeah. have the paternity leave. Mm -hmm. You have different things that, that we as women need in order to function professionally and as a family and as you know your personal life and yeah. they don't cater to that no so no, not at all yeah. no. i think i mean as terrible as the the pandemic has been i think it's shown a lot of uh businesses and a lot of corporations what it can be like to be a little bit more flexible mm -hmm. you know so hopefully it's a good thing so that people can start having a little bit more flexibility in their lives to do right. some other things other than just work right 
you know, and you then, can do your passions. If you want to join the military, join the military, right, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and then men realize what it's like to be home. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and to have to juggle, you know, a meeting with, mm-hmm. you know, with your boss or who or a new client and, yeah. and you've got, you know, the kids running around and, and right. cats running in and, He's and showing actors here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. So I think, the pandemic for the most part is, is awful, you know, having to go through this, but I think it has been teaching everybody what the real priority is, you know, Uh, it defines what success means to each person. It doesn't have to be, you know, status and money and that sort of thing. If that's what you're going for, then, you know, fine. But, you know, you, I think well, people that are well-rounded have the important things in their life. And obviously you need to work because you yeah. need to live. Right. <laughs> you don't work to live, you live to work, you know, yeah. it depends where you want to go with that. But right. I think it's taught us a lot of, of priorities in, in our lives and, yeah. and managing and juggling with everything that you yeah. have. Yeah. And uh, definitely maybe it's um can help change some things for the better or just even like opening people's eyes to um like or just like you were saying with men seeing what it's like to be at home with the kids and trying to do their jobs so you know uh, and there, there are men out there who are our main caregivers and, and oh, women. my brother is, or well my brother is a stay-at-home father actually yeah <laughs> yeah so. so so there are men that that choose that that can then that are okay with it. And that's great. You know, I mean, and, uh, and a lot of them are hands on too, but that that's going to take several generations to, to get that mindset and culture. Absolutely. To change. Yeah. And people are afraid of change. Like it's, <laughs> yes, they are a weird <laughs> thing. Cause you think a progress is good or change is exciting, but some right. people are just like to head butt against it. <laughs> right. Um, right. Exactly, exactly. So it just just depends, you know, and, yeah. and women in, in, in flying positions, you know, being away is hard, you know, you can mm-hmm. uh, talk to my daughter, I didn't realize how hard it was for her, mm. for me to be away. Yeah. And, you know, we had the opportunity to talk many years ago. And, and it, it was tough, but she's a very smart, intelligent, independent young woman right now and those are experiences that she had to learn how to adapt to to the situation you know so it's not fun when you're going through it but on the other side of it the outcome is is just a stronger person right yeah absolutely yeah um Yeah. yeah there's um we have a uh 17 year old intern this summer with uh, my, our company and she wants to be a filmmaker and um like I was like you should be in charge she's <laughs> like she, she's done so much on her own already but one of her questions she's always asking me is um, being a woman in the film industry because it's you hear the stories about um how it can be very difficult and it's I think it's a very runs very similar to the um aviation um, industry as well as at least for yeah. pilots that women directors all male dominated and so you have to you know navigate through that system and yeah yeah so So, and when you were talking about that like just I was like I can identify with all (laughs) exactly exactly yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. it's just kind of learning how to work in that environment and um try not to get too angry sometimes right (laughs) well just this week um the women in aviation chapter here and the 99s chapter Mm -hmm. here um we we got together two and a half three weeks ago and at the request of a councilwoman you know where stinson municipal airport is i don't know if you know about stinson but it's the second oldest operating airport in the u.s oh that's awesome yeah Catherine stinson I know Catherine Simpson. (laughs) Okay. So that's where she had her flight school with her sister and and her, and her brother, Eddie, 
Um, so we formed a four ship formation flight. We had two Cessnas, a Bonanza and a Symphony. Mm -hmm. And the fourth aircraft was in the formation, but it was considered chase. So she kind of flew a couple hundred feet above the formation. Mm -hmm. And it was to celebrate the 100th year of the 19th Amendment, the woman's right to vote. Yes. So <laughs> it was very significant for us. So this yeah. past Friday, we, we did a, a, a flyover the city of San Antonio hitting a couple of key points, uh, landmarks around the city. Um, and we we flew over, the, the key points I have to say is the Providence um, Catholic High School, it was all female, Incarnate Word High School, all female. And then the Women's Leadership Academy mm -hmm. is all female. So those were the highlights of, of the route. But we flew over the city, over the Tower of the Americas, Fort Sam Houston, where military aviation started. So it was all all great, you know. We had a big turn, not turnout, because very minimal people uh, were able to come because we can't gather, and you know, with social distancing and everything. But the people that did come, our families and stuff really enjoyed it and it was covered oh, yeah. uh, by the news so it was it was it was a great yeah. time very historic you know it was all female mm -hmm. uh, pilots in in both seats that's both awesome seats. yeah um, which I, you did an all-female flyover of the super bowl correct no it was the uh indianapolis speedway oh okay was, okay oh, was, very uh, cool. T38, yeah t38 all female flyby uh -huh. fly over the speedway and we had to get instruct female instructors from three three or four different bases at the time because there weren't enough females to put together a four ship formation yeah <laughs> what year so that, was that? That was do you remember do i remember what year, what year? oh yes i want to say it was like 1982 oh, or 1983. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, wow. That's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, that was the first, the first uh, convention for the women military aviators. Oh, At the okay. time, it was called Women Military Pilots Association, uh -huh. and then later changed to mili uh, Women Military Aviators, because now we have, you know, crew chiefs and boom okay. operators and, you yeah. know, all kinds of females in the aviation, in the military aviation that are included yeah. that's, that's awesome. awesome um i'm you're telling these start the story about um katherine stinson and um at the, at the airport and the catholic school and i don't know i'm gonna probably messing this up but um i believe it was her um if not it was somebody else from her generation's um pilot but she went to a uh, all girls catholic school and when she was 16, she got her license and buzzed the school and the um, administration was like, you can't, you know, like, got, like, you're not allowed, women, girls are not allowed to drive cars. And she's like, but I wasn't driving a car. I was flying an airplane. <laughs> they were ready to kick her out. <laughs> I didn't break the rules, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. black and white. Yeah. You don't have a rule for this yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking about that when you said you flew over an all-girls school, and I was like, oh, I think I remember this story. I think, I think it's her, but I'll have to double-check that. <laughs> we do too many stories, or I do, I read too much about um, uh, women pilots that I can't, I sometimes I forget them mixed up on who's who. Uh, right. But uh, do you have, do you have a favorite flying memory? Oh, gosh. <laughs> there's there's so many in in phases of flight and uh, I have to say formation flying in a T38 is mm. my favorite type of flying. So any formation flight I did favorite. Yeah. <laughs> but um commercially I have to say my favorite flight that is so vivid in my mind is we were flying into Washington, D.C., into uh, the national airport there. And we, we 
took a VFR clearance to land, flew over the Potomac uh, River. And it was just about dusk. So we came down. Unfortunately, there was an aircraft on the runway. Mm -hmm. So we had to go around and do it again. Oh, no. Yeah, another, you know, and I'm like, okay. And I was flying. We came around and at that time, the lights started coming on, on the National Mall. You could see Whoa. the memorials starting to light up the White House, everything. I mean, it's, it was an incredible experience mm -hmm. to, to see that, you know. And um, so that's, that's kind of my favorite time of day. Yeah, stuff. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's that the most great. memorable for, for my commercial uh, aviation that, that I really love. But there's so many, but yeah, that, that's the one that sticks out to me. That's really cool. So is the T-38 then your favorite, favorite airplane to fly or do you have another one? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Who would want to strap that thing on? I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. I guess yeah. it, is. It, is. it is. In fact, one of the just this morning, I was looking at um, my LinkedIn feed, and and I see that one of the uh, universities here they uh, they teach A and P. You know, they have a yeah. aviation department teaching A and P, and they had ju they just acquired a T thirty eight. Oh, yeah. And so, um, I, uh, I I I put on their feed. I I put on their feed. I said, Hey, I know you're just using it for mechanics and engines and you know, rehauling. But if you ever get it to fly, I'm available. So I <laughs> offer my services. Let me let me know. I can help you out. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. I can help you out. So, right around the corner. <laughs> but I don't know if you all saw the commercial, the Modelo commercial. Yeah. In fact, we were going to ask you about that too. Oh, okay. <laughs> so they they actually had to um, hire that T-38. It's a privately owned T-38. I think they're oh. in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And um, and they they had to, to hire that pilot and an aircraft to come in for filming okay. that, that commercial. Mm -hmm. What was pretty neat is um, they had this, I think it was a BMW Audi or something with a, a camera set up in the, in the, in the sun roof, I guess, with an yeah. arm out. Mm -hmm. And they had to chase it down yeah. the runway to get those oh, shots. Cool. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was really cool. Yeah. Really cool. So. I've seen those. I they have a name for that, and I'm sure right. my husband could tell me. But um, I when I Fast and the Furious Eight filmed here in Cleveland several mm -hmm. years ago, and they had that, and that was really cool to get to watch them use that and chase the cars yeah. and stuff. I know. I know. Um, so. well, how did the Modelo commercial come about? Well, um, one of the reps for Ogilvy. I don't know if you're familiar. Ogilvy is one of the largest world uh, um, marketing and advertising firms. They're based out of London, but they have offices in, in Chicago. Anyway, one of their, their representatives was searching the internet and they found my story. And so they wanted to pitch it to their client, Constellation Brands, which owns Modelo and Corona and all these other beers, but they were making these specific Modelo commercials mm -hmm. with featuring role models, you know, mm -hmm. so they're yeah. not only featuring their beer, but they were featuring their so role models in the uh, Hispanic Latin community. And he found my story and wanted to pitch it, but he had to contact me first before he could pitch it to his client. So we get a phone call through women in aviation mm -hmm. and one of the board members uh, were talking and she goes, oh, by the way, I have a, a, a voice message here. Somebody wants you to do a commercial. <laughs> like, what? So I got a, an inquiry through LinkedIn also, but they didn't leave a phone number. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay. 
Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't going to go in there and answer it. And oh. then she tells me there was a, so they were trying to get a hold of me at different places. Long story short, I talked to him. He says, we want you to do a beer commercial. And I told him, well, you know, that alcohol and flying kind of does not go. So okay. that, how, do, how do you want to do this? Because, yeah. you know, I'm not about drinking beer and going flying. Right. That, that's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so then he he told me what it was about and then I went back and looked a couple of their of their commercials mm -hmm. and what sold me was their their tagline which was it doesn't matter where you come from mm -hmm. it matters yeah. what you're made of yeah and I said I was sold then I talked to the family my daughter's like mom it's all about you you have to do this yeah I'm like okay so that's how it went and it was amazing they pitched it to their client they loved it yeah and so they had all featured you know all these male football players or astronauts or whatever so i was their first female to yeah. be um featured on on their commercials which was an honor and 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 pretty neat pretty neat yeah. and, and it's a really cool commercial it's a great they, commercial yeah, yeah. It's, it's a great, great commercial job. thanks yeah they they did a great job. The whole crew was amazing. You know, I mean, it was a great experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember when it came on the first time I saw it, my husband and I were watching TV and we were like, what? Like we had to rewind it. So we could watch it. <laughs> Cause you're like, I can't believe they're doing this. <laughs> like it's so yeah. nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but it's, it's incredible how, you know, it has kind of helped me with the platform, mm -hmm. especially my passion to get girls into STEM, sure. obviously into aviation, but you know, I think STEM is the, the big thing since yeah. I wanted to be a math major. I have, mm -hmm. you know, graduate as a math major, but, but still, you know, I always tell girls that why fit in when you can stand out, you know? I mean, so what if you're smart? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, you can do it. Don't yeah. let people push you down just because you're smarter than they are. Yeah. You know? Surround yourself with people who support you and, mm -hmm. and cheer you on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a couple nieces that I'm always like, don't let ever, anyone ever make you feel bad about be, wanting to be yourself. Like, right. Yeah. Um, exactly. Exactly. You know, and, and so much for our community too, you know, underserved community, uh, a lot of these kids don't have those opportunities or aren't exposed to any of this. And, yeah. and like, like, you know, you, you've been hearing, if you can't see it, you can't be it, you know? And yeah. so yeah. so right. important, so important to see females out there, you know, in, in different non-traditional yeah. professions that is really, really important to, uh, <laughs> to, to get them interested, to let them know that that's an option, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cause all it wasn't an option yeah. for me. I never thought of it, you know, but right. yeah. had I been exposed, who knows if I would have gotten into aviation a lot sooner than I did, but you know, everything happens for a reason and mm -hmm. right place at the right time. And, yeah. and you know, you, you find your purpose and, and, and you live it. And so yeah. that's, that's important. Yeah. yeah. We, I volunteer at a, um, at a commemorative Air Force unit up here in Minnesota. And on Saturday, we had a little girl come over and she wants, she's five and she wants to be a fighter pilot. And she was dressed in a fighter pilot uniform and the whole nine yards. And we happened to have the um, uh, Tuskegee Airmen, the P-51 there. And so we let her sit in it. And her mom sent us pictures and said that, like, and it was just so neat to be able to inspire that a little bit more yeah because you know, she had never actually seen a fighter and i'm like well do you want to sit in it and she was just like <laughs> i can sit in it and so we kind of went through and you know here's how you fly it and all this kind of stuff and i mean it was just it was just the coolest <laughs> so, yeah yes yes yeah. we, we um, did a, a, an air show at randolph and this tiny girl, I, let's say she was two and a half, three years old. Let's say she was, she was dressed as Amelia Earhart. Oh, I'm, I was like, oh my God, just the sweetest. And, but she was, and then at one of our 
aviation, uh, girls for aviation day mm -hmm. in aviation day we had one little girl she was eight years old she already had a t-shirt says i'm going to be an astronaut so she already knows what she wants to be and i'm like perfect go get it yeah go get it don't yeah. let anything stop you yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> well the the newest class uh, astronaut class i almost 47 percent are female which is fantastic i know it's amazing it's almost it, huh? right yeah right I so love that's, it. that's fantastic and and i'm glad more women are are doing that mm -hmm. yeah so. yeah. yeah i can't wait until it's not a thing anymore and it's just normal where it's right. like yeah what do you mean like it it's weird for women to do that right, right. yeah right. i have a friend right. whose daughter is um because we're doing like we keep talking about this 1929 women's air race and his daughter is just like, what? Like they, I don't, it, she can't comprehend that they, that people didn't want women flying airplanes. She's like, I don't get right. it. <laughs> Cause she's right. like, that was yeah. a thing. Like, that's weird. <laughs> well, we, we still have a long way to go. Yeah, you know? exactly. It's going to take a lot of generations to, to get through that. It's like nurses. They all used to be male. And then yeah. women went into it. Now it's, you know, it's yeah. male or female, but now you associate it more with, with females. Women, sure. yeah. Um, you know, so who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I love that you do um, so much work with the younger generation. Yeah. And with oh, yeah. them. And it's, that's a, um, a, a big thing in my, in my heart that hurts when girls shy away from science because right whatever, whatever reason they've decided um mostly because because i wanted to be a, i wanted to do something in science and i chose filmmaking instead but i love filmmaking <laughs> but i also yeah. that's why i'm always like oh i would really wish i would have done the science thing <laughs> did you study filmmaking mm -hmm. i did i went to school for that it was between that and paleontology so now i um volunteer at the natural history museum um in the <laughs> burke paleo department so at least i get to live out my dream that way. <laughs> and where do you live then? Uh, uh, we're, in, we're in Cleveland, Ohio. In Cleveland. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. When the pandemic is not happening, I get to go in and volunteer, but right now they're not having um, right. volunteers in, in the Berkeley. Yeah. So okay. um, eventually we'll get to clean dinosaur bones again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a lot here in Texas. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we could go on a little trip and go clean some dinosaur bones down in Texas. We yeah. like that, down in Texas already. Like that kid who found some remains in his backyard. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. That's amazing. You didn't hear about that? No, I haven't yeah. seen that. Yeah, look it up. Look yeah. it up. He was okay. just cool. in it. Yep. Yeah. He oh, that's so cool. I think they may have named it after him. I don't know. So. That's awesome. Wait, yeah. That would yeah. be so cool. <laughs> Texas also has lots of airplanes because we've been there many, many times to film yes. stories about airplanes. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, we do, we yeah. do, because the weather's for the most part so so good, you know. Yeah. They, it's not like Minnesota, where for six months out of the year you can't fly. <laughs> <laughs> or at least three. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You can fly; it's just cold. It's just cold. Nobody wants to fly below ten, you know, below ten degrees. Let's be honest. No. Um, hmm. I've definitely flown one. It was, I think it was six. And I was like, mm, I didn't like that at all. <laughs> one of my lessons. And I was, I, I did not, I was like, I just don't want to fly when it's cold. So yeah, it definitely so, makes the months in, in Cleveland. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then in Texas, it's a hundred degrees. <laughs> um, yes. Flip side. <laughs> <laughs> right. The flip side. That's yeah. It. That's very, very true. Um, well, Amy, do you have any more questions? I don't think so. Do you have anything else that you want to share with us, Olga? Um, let's see. We, uh, I do work with the Order of Dedalians, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. Um, I'm a trustee with the foundation. The Order of Dedalians is a military aviators the oldest military aviators association started world war ii i think yeah. and all male when i graduated pilot training it was a thing that new pilots would be able to join but it was a fraternity so mm. i figured that i had too many other 
doors to open. Mm -hmm. And that, that wasn't in my priority, but I always wanted to belong to that, you know, um, to honor the pilots, you know, that came before yeah. that were current, you know, and, and advocate for, for air and space and all that. Mm -hmm. So in the foundation, as a trustee, I'm part of the scholarship committee. So I get to give money away, which is oh, pretty awesome. neat. <laughs> yes, awesome. it's pretty neat. And, um, and I try to be as active as I can going out to ROTC units, trying to get students interested in aviation, believe it or not. There's not a lot of ROTC cadets that get into aviation through ROTC you know, mostly come for the academy or, you know, yeah. very small through uh, officer training school commissions. But um, that's, that's one of the things that, that I enjoy doing is, is getting those young ROTC cadets uh, money to help them through school to, to mm -hmm. finish and, and get an aviation position in, in the military. So, so th those are one of the things. And then the D Howard Foundation, we have a pre-K through 12 initiative to, to take STEM into the, the school districts. And oh, so right. I'm involved with that too. And so I, I, I wear many hats, but they're all kind of related and, and I enjoy that. And then I, I go, you know, do keynotes, speaking tour, universities, corporations, wherever I'm invited and kind of share what I did, what I do and, yeah. and how to, how to influence and, and, and take care of the young, young kids nowadays and see what their needs yeah. are. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. I love that the um, keep pushing the mission forward is, um, is very right. nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Thanks so much for being with us today. It's, yeah. it's been a, a pleasure getting to, to chat with you and getting to know you and um, sharing your, your story. Yeah. Yeah. It was really nice to talk to you. I, Amy and I have been very excited about it, <laughs> including oh, uh, yes. lots, lots of talking and Amy's like, I'm nervous. And I'm like, why? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to be nervous about. No. <laughs> uh, but I'm glad Chris uh, connected us. He's such a great no. guy, he's such a great friend. And, yeah. and um, the opportunity to go up to Oshkosh has been just amazing. Amazing. Yeah. 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 We, we're, we're there every year, sometimes twice a year, because Chris will have us come up to do presentations for him. So, and I think that's out of his like selfish need for wanting to hang out. <laughs> there we go. That's the excuse. Oh, you got to yeah, go. Yeah. Let's go hang out. Yeah. Um, kind of missed it this year. Yeah. Uh, that was sad. But hopefully next year, then we'll see you in person. Right? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Um, we are this year. We well, this year we are planning on staying all week because we usually only do a couple of days. Oh, really? And we're like, next year we'll do a whole week, and we're going to the seaplane base because we haven't been there. I haven't been there either. I oh. want to. Go. Yes. Yeah, and then it was canceled. Yeah. <laughs> so next year we are planning on going for the whole week, so we can yeah. be there for the whole thing. So I know. If we go to the seaplane base, we'll let you know. Yes. <laughs> <You> can, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Olga, for joining us. And um, for our viewers, um, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out our Facebook page for more info because we're always posting more stuff about women in aviation there. Um, and thanks to Adam White for helping us produce our episodes. And he's staring at me like he didn't do anything. <laughs> uh, and our sponsors, Hemlock Films and Spotlight. Spotlight Business Solutions, and thanks for listening to Air Raid Radio, and we will catch you the next episode.